God, for the many ways that you provide for us, we cannot begin to stop and count them. But they are many, as many as the stars in the sky. Thank you for allowing us to take what you've given us and use it in accordance to your will, returning it to you so it can be blessed and multiplied. Continue to use us, O God. Continue to use what you provide, O God, to grow your kingdom here in our little edge of Waterford and throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses, what did I have right down? 24 to 26. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. Would you all pray with me, please? Loving God, in this hour and in this place, I ask that you grant to me the gift of preaching, that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth bring glory to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. To the beloved gathered in this house today, I ask that you grant them the gift of hearing. May our time together grow us closer to you as we unlock the mystery of the scriptures, as we give ourselves to you in communion and as we continue to serve in your Son's name. Amen. How many of us have simply followed the crowd? Show of hands. That's it. We've got some stubborn people then. How many of us at a social event have talked about a subject that normally would make us uncomfortable, but we engage in the conversation to feel included? Anyone ever do that? Okay. How many of us have been swept up by the charismatic energy of a group of people who were engaged in a behavior that damaged someone's property or hurt someone's feelings, knowing that it was wrong? How many of us have ever done that? You know, last week when I asked if we sinned, everyone put their hands up high. Now that I'm asking a little more specifically, we're going... (laughs) Why in those situations do we follow the crowd when... We sense, feel, hear the calling of the Spirit to us saying, you don't have to do this to feel like you belong. Why did we do it? Why? In my sermon last week, I talked about how we are a people who are spiritually split right down the middle between trusting and following the will of God who created us, created to be one with us, versus following our own counsel and believing that we know what is best for ourselves, the sin that is embedded within our bodies. The Bible is very clear. Each time we choose not to trust God, we sin. Each time we choose not to love our neighbors but love ourselves instead, We sin. It's a day-to-day struggle, sometimes a moment-by-moment struggle of wanting to follow God unconditionally, but the weakness and the brokenness of my sin at times stops me. Jesus came to wash away the burden of the sin, so God would not hold us accountable for our sins, hold them against us. He did not remove, though. He did not remove, though the struggle we have against committing a sin. He gave us another option. Each time we choose to love... uh, Being fully God and being fully human, I think Jesus understood this struggle more than we give him credit. I think he understood it to a great degree in standing there in front of 
Pilate with a fickle crowd behind him, all wanting to hear if Jesus would be convicted by a Roman governor under Roman law. Why was Jesus standing there? Sinless, perfect son of the living God, sent by God to save the world, to save us by first saving God's chosen people, the Jews, who for 400 years, give or take a couple of decades, the Jews living in Israel and those scattered throughout the world had been waiting for God to fulfill his promise to send the one who would save them, anoint them, put them above everyone else, make them the uplifted kingdom those who everyone would turn to and respect and go, wow, they got it going on, to put them in that place. And in the return, they would be a pure, unblemished, perfect people before God. They would be blessed. They would no longer be the people who were conquered and scattered so many times by invading armies that brought their pagan idols and religions and laws, forcing the chosen people of God to recognize these pagan ways as, well, for lack of a better term, superior to theirs. The prophecies as interpreted between the Old Testament and the New Testament believed that the Messiah would come and cover the land with one strip stroke would basically drive out all their enemies and God would be put in reign forever as superior and they would come along with it. This was the popular opinion of Jews throughout Palestine in the time when Jesus came into the world. This was the popular opinion of the Jews throughout Palestine in the time that Jesus began his ministry. And this was the popular opinion of the Jews throughout the world who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of the Passover at the time when Jesus made his triumphant entry. If there was ever a time when God would save his people, they thought, from the oppression that they lived under, it would be during the festival in which, God, in which they celebrated that God saved them from their Egyptian slavery so many centuries before. And who perpetuated this information? Who perpetuated this idea? Who kept feeding it to the masses? The leaders of the temple. Caiaphas, the high priest, and his father-in-law, Annas a ruling member of the community and of the law body, the Sanhedrin. From Caiaphas and Annas, the message went to the temple by the way of the Sanhedrin, the priests and the Levites, the temple helpers. From the temple, the message traveled down to the rabbis who taught in the small locals and villages and towns and schools. You ever wonder why the disciples struggled so much with the message that Jesus brought to them? Ever wonder why the disciples struggled struggled so much with the method and means of how he exercised God's love to the people around them. He went directly to the poor, the sick, and the outcasts when the priests refused to. The way God called Jesus to save Israel and the world was different from the expectation put forward by the leaders of the crowd. Reinhold Niebuhr, one of my favorite all-time writers, defines sin as egoism, in which our own, our personal wants, desires, and expectations become the center point of our lives. He also wrote that crowds and nations develop a collective egoism in which the group is more arrogant, hypocritical, self-centered, and more ruthless in pursuit of its ends than taking care of the individual's. The effect of inflicting pain on an individual by a crowd is greater because the intensity of fear of being cast out from the crowd is more powerful. That's why we join. It doesn't matter where you are. You could be at the mall hanging out with your friends, at lunch with co-workers, acquaintances at a card club on some night, or even a good old-fashioned church potluck. If there is a crowd... We want to have, we have this wanted desire to be part of it, to be included. Why? Because we are afraid to be rejected. We are afraid to be cast out. 
because we ourselves do not want to become targets. Will we choose to follow the crowds who put forth ideas and agendas which we fundamentally find different from our own? We do this because we're afraid. And because of this, the groups have a power to manipulate our emotion and help us to inflict damage on people at a whole new level, levels we haven't even thought of or imagined. Think about world leaders that we've had through history. Hitler, Stalin, rogue dictators. What about the extremists in the Islamic movement happening in the world today? How are they so powerful at moving the crowds? The only way that I understand this is through the power and the management of information. On a Palm Sunday, we will gather and we will celebrate the triumphant entry of Jesus, our Savior. And on that day, the crowds gave shouts of joy when he came in, saying, Save us now. By the time the end of that week came, that same crowd who were sounding accolades of how Jesus would save them were now calling for his life to hang on the cross. How did this happen? All it took was for the high priest to tell the crowds that this very popular healer from Nazareth is really a blasphemer, someone who curses against God instead of rescuing them. The high priest manipulated the facts in their favor, playing on the emotions of the people, making them more likely to be cooperative with his personal agenda of getting Jesus out of the way because he was not the, the Messiah that was expected. He was not the Messiah who appealed to the upper class of society. He was a Messiah who was expected to be the one who came to fulfill the chosen people, the people who the church deemed accepting, worthy, not the world. Caiaphas didn't put God first. And in doing so, instead of accepting God's son standing before him, he got the crowd to dehumanize him, to demonize him, until he was eventually crucified. Ouch. I believe today there is no generation that is more prone to be sucked in and taken advantage of by this kind of strategy than our very own. On television, through the internet, propaganda is thrown at us by intentional leaders of companies, competing politicians, bloggers, and preachers telling us that anyone who disagrees with us, anyone who disagrees with our opinion, with my opinion, they should be considered evil and an enemy. Because American Christians, in particular, have privatized the world and understanding of sin. They have ignored how sinful group dynamics can become. We are often manipulated and co-opted into things that we would never consider or do on our own. All because we want to be included. The only one who understood that in this passage today was Pilate. Pilate. Pilate gets a bad, bad rap that he didn't jump in and intervene, but he had his own issues to deal with being a Roman governor. Judea was not the prized place to be a governor. It was a pit of problems. And if you didn't succeed, well, like Pilate, you were never heard from again in history. But Pilate did something very smart. He stood there and saw a man who had broken no laws, but he saw a mob that was massing and about to riot something that he did not want to suppress, something he did not want to deal with. But because he would not take it on himself to condemn Jesus, he said, he has done nothing wrong in my eyes. He has done nothing wrong according to the laws that I bring. So I wash my hands. In other words, I choose not to follow you. You have to make up your own minds. And they did. They choose to have Barabbas freed. They chose a man who was convicted in Roman court, convicted in Jewish court, 
of doing wrong things, of hurting people. They chose to have him go free and have Jesus hung on a cross. Pilate literally washed his hands of the situation, not allowing himself to follow the will of the crowd. He followed what his heart was telling him. Leave this man alone and let him do what he needs to be doing in the name of his God. Sin is a social force that we participate in. There are many answers in the scriptures that kind of help guide us through it to kind of avoid these landmines. But one of my favorites comes out of 2 Chronicles, which says, If my people who are called by not my name humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin. It's humility that is the key of overcoming sin, not self-justification, not saying, well, I was just with the crowd, and I really didn't mean it. It's to say, yeah, I did that. I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. Forgive me. The Bible speaks strongly against sin from both Testaments. Here's my question, people of God. Why don't we? Our silence, our dulled consciousness, our complicit behavior immediately indicts us. The Bible, but, but the Bible offers a two-part strategy for dealing with sins in groups, sins of crowds, sins of nations. First, we need to clean up our act. Peter writes in his letters, For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God, right here in this house amongst ourselves, us and each other, us and God. How do we as the local church participate in power games and sinful behaviors within our own walls? How do we in fellowship with other congregations justify ourselves while demonizing others, especially people who don't think like us, act like us, worship like us, have fun like us? Yes, the Bible tells us to clean up our act first, but in truth, we cannot do it on our very own. We can only confess that we are sinners that we can't clean it up on our own, and we need to ask for the saving grace from a loving God. Second, we have to become an alternative society within this world, what Jesus offered the vision as the kingdom of God. As the church, we must be giving a constant picture of a group redeemed and saved from sin. That means we play a role of prophet and missionary in the calling of our world to Christ's standards. It also means that we demonstrate this standard in ways that we treat people both in our church and outside of our church body. Just as we underrate the power of group sin, we can also, at the same time, underestimate the power of group redemption. In the face of natural disasters, we watch groups together in clubs, churches, and communities do more than anyone could have possibly done on their own. Jesus began this movement that we are part of to continue today. He began this movement with 12 people. We call them apostles, disciples. The church found its strength as a living organism known to one another as the body of of Christ. Jesus saw the potential of the church to transform the world when it became a collaborative force of the Holy Spirit. Does anyone see that potential here? I do. Will our world around us find its hands and find itself in the hands of a loving church? if they walk in the doors because we choose to be different and not follow the crowds of the world? I hope so. The question is very simple. Will we choose to follow the crowd or will we trust our God and follow Jesus instead, no matter where it takes us? 
Will you pray with me, please? <clears throat> we are always faced with choices, O oh God. Following the sin that is in our flesh or following your spirit that is in our heart, in our soul, and in our minds. Help us to choose you each and every time. In Jesus' name, amen.